from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up during our first half hour, K-State's Dallas Peterson will be in to go over the newly announced re-registration of dicamba herbicides for direct application to dicamba-resistant soybeans and cotton, and the modifications that have been made to the regulations for using this weed control technology. Dallas will also report on his research into the actual impact of dicamba drift on non-resistant soybeans and the variables that affect yield response there. Also today, K-State's Charlie Lee will take a look at a promising new rodenticide approach to pocket gopher and vole control in crop fields and home lawns, which may eventually be labeled for use. These topics and more covered next on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Thanks for joining us once more. There's been new information out now on a herbicide option that you soybean growers and cotton growers as well here in the state of Kansas would likely be attuned to. It has to do with the dicamba-resistant varieties of those crops and the chemistry that will allow one to treat those directly over the top with a dicamba product. What's happened with dicamba is our topic now with Dallas Peterson, a weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We bring this up, Dallas, because the Environmental Protection Agency has just extended the registration of those three dicamba herbicides for direct application on soybeans and cotton, and uh, with some stipulations that uh, weren't there before, right? Uh, Absolutely. In fact, the long-anticipated announcement uh, on the the re-registration of these three new products. Uh, Earlier this summer, EPA indicated that they would make an announcement and a decision on whether they would be re-registered late summer. Well, late summer came and went and no announcement. And again, we've kind of been waiting on this. And finally, on Halloween, actually, is when they came out with the announcement that they had decided to go ahead and approve the re-registration for an additional two years. So until December of 2020. So that's where we stand at this point in time. They did, however, make some further label adjustments uh, to those products uh, as far as uh, use guidelines uh, for the next two years. And we want to walk through those, but just to further set the table as to why this registration, now re-registration, is important here and those new guidelines, these products have had an interesting history since their introduction, right? Well, they certainly have, and dicamba is not a new active ingredient at all. In fact, it's been around for 50 years. And we've always known that it has been susceptible to non-target injury on susceptible plants. And soybeans is perhaps the most susceptible plant that is out there. So historically, we've used dicamba in a number of different crops and situations. But for the most part, we avoided using it uh, in soybean growing areas during the soybean growing season because of concerns with that non-target injury and drift. Uh, So... When the Extend soybeans were introduced, which are resistant to dicamba, there was quite a bit of concern about that potential for injury. And so at that point in time, EPA did approve just a two-year registration with the the idea that we could see kind of what happened. There were concerns about non-target injury. It wasn't unanticipated at all, but maybe we didn't have any idea what the scope of it would be. Unfortunately, it was pretty severe. Uh, Even in the year prior to the approval of these herbicides, when there was no dicamba approved for use on extended soybeans, there were problems in Arkansas. Uh, They had uh, approved the soybean varieties the year before and went ahead and released those without an approved herbicide. And so 
farmers uh, figured that out pretty quickly. Uh, they'd been battling herbicide-resistant Palmer amaranth, especially uh, with glyphosate resistance, and so they were looking at a new uh, solution to try to deal with that. And so there were a number of illegal applications back in 2016, even of uh, non-registered dicamba products on Extend soybeans, and not surprisingly, there were lots of uh, issues with non-target injury. They finally approved the new lower volatility formulations, and there were three of those products, uh, the Extend to Max uh, from Monsanto. Vexapan from DuPont, those two are pretty much identical, and Ingenia from BASF, all three of them lower in volatility than the older formulations of Banville and Clarity. And it was hoped that we would have fewer problems because there would be less potential from vapor drift. But unfortunately, still in 2017, there were a lot of uh, non-target injury problems. It wasn't all drift-related. Some of it was tank uh, sprayer contamination issues. Uh, There was a lot of debate about whether it was physical drift with the wind or vapor drift, and unfortunately, it's very difficult to know. The bottom line is is that there were a lot of problems. So even after that season, they made a number of additional label changes to try and address that situation. Uh, And one of those was to reclassify those products as restricted-use products and to put uh, even further application guidelines on those. Again, hoping that that would help for this year. And I think in Kansas, at least, it wasn't as bad this year as it was last year. Then seemed nearly as contentious, not at least nearly, in these parts. Yeah, not nearly as widespread and, and not as serious where we did have it, uh, but yet it was still out there. And in fact, if you look at the number of official complaints, the Kansas Department of Ag, it was basically the same from 2017 to 2018. But again, a lot of people don't report it to the Kansas Department of Ag. It's only those real contentious situations normally where that gets reported. So my perception, at least, is it wasn't nearly as serious uh, this last year as the year before, but it still was more common uh, than we would like it to have been. So that brings us around, Dallas, to the newly announced registrations and the additional precautions with using dicamba herbicides over the top of these resistant soybeans or cotton. There are a number of these. What stands out to you initially? Yeah, they keep, again, trying to refine uh, the label uh, use guidelines to to reduce the potential for non-target entry. But again, we don't fully understand. I don't believe everything that's going on, unfortunately. And Uh, applicators are still not clear on all of the guidelines because uh, they're very complex, it seems like, and and oftentimes not real clear uh, to the applicator. Some of the most uh, significant changes, however, from last year to this year is that not only do all applicators uh, have to have oxen or dicamba-specific training, that was a new requirement last year, Uh, But all applicators also now have to be certified applicators. Themselves. Themselves. Last year, they were reclassified as restricted-use pesticides, which means you had to have certification to buy the products. But the applicator could do that under the direct supervision of a certified applicator. So this year, uh, that is no longer allowable. Uh, You have to be both certified and have the oxen-specific training to actually make those applications. So that's one of the changes that, uh, that they made this year. Uh, there are several others, but probably the most uh, significant one is uh, the time of day in which you're allowed to make these applications. Now, from the very beginning, application during a temperature inversion was restricted, prohibited. Uh, a lot of people didn't understand when temperature inversions occurred. There's no easy way to know that, to be honest with you. But they do occur almost every night uh, in our most common during the nighttime hours. And they perpetuate drift by and large then? Or uh, temperature inversions certainly uh, can facilitate uh, drift, uh, absolutely. Both probably physical drift and vapor drift, they can make it much worse than when you don't have an inversion. So last year they modified the label to... Uh, restrict application only to after sunup to sunrise, okay? This year, they further changed that to one hour after sunrise to two hours before sunset. So, again, that's uh, minimizing the time in which you can apply it. So, again, it has to be during that time frame. 
The other big confounding factor, of course, is the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, wind can facilitate especially the physical movement. And so it's windy during the middle of the day most of the time. And so it's most calm during, you know, the early morning and the late evening hours. But again, that also coincides with when temperature inversions occur. So now you have to wait until one hour after sunrise before you can make those applications. And then you must stop making those applications two hours before sunset. One of the other guidelines that catches one's eye, there are now restrictions on applying within certain days after planting soybeans or cotton. Yeah, last year uh, the guidelines were based upon developmental stages, and it was different between cotton and soybeans. Uh, with soybeans, I believe it was R1. That restriction is still on there, uh, but they've also added an additional restriction of 45 days after planting. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, in most cases, the soybeans are going to be moving into the R1 stage by 45 days after planting. So uh, the way they've stated that is whichever occurs first. The guidelines on cotton were actually more open last year than this year. Uh, you could apply it almost throughout the entire season. This year, they say to mid-bloom or up to 60 days after planting. And this is to avoid volatilization of the product, mm, correct? You would think that would be to try to minimize the potential for drift, if you will, during the more susceptible time frames because uh, both of them do become more injurious uh, when we get into those reproductive stages. Uh, but also that oftentimes coincides with hotter temperatures and more potential for vapor drift uh, as well. Uh, the number of post-emergence applications over the top of cotton also has been reduced from four to two. So I'm not sure those restrictions are going to make a big deal. Ideally, we want our producers making those applications early in the season anyway to get uh, the best weed control and, again, also to avoid those more critical times uh, for injuring, you know, susceptible plants. Dallas, there's more we'd like to dig into regarding the newly re-registered dicamba products over the top on soybeans and cotton resistant to dicamba and some work that you've been conducting here at K-State on the impact of dicamba exposure on soybean yields and productivity. If you'd stand by, we'll get into that in just a moment. Dallas Peterson is our guest. He is a weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension. He'll be back Mike side with us after this over the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and our guest is Dallas Peterson, Weed Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We're exploring some of the finer points of the new announcement out of the Environmental Protection Agency upon the re-registration of three dicamba herbicides for application on dicamba-tolerant soybeans and cotton. That word just came out here a few days back. Dallas, you just walked through some of the finer points of the re-registration details here, but there's still some some latitude here in as far as how this will all be handled from state to state. Yeah, uh, one of the other changes that I failed to mention earlier is that the oxen-specific training now has been clearly stated that it has to be done every year. And so that's quite a burden. Uh, we spent a lot of time doing training last year, and it was not the same from state to state. In some states, only the registrants provided the training. In other states, uh, only extension service provided training. In some, it was just their department of ag that provided this, the training. In Kansas, actually, it was provided by both extension uh, and the registrants, uh, and, and you could get that from either place. But again, there was a lot of meetings uh, last year, uh, a lot of commitment to do that. That is the other uh, thing that uh, came out of uh, the re-registration process is that they were going to 
uh, require that on an annual basis. Now, maybe they'll go to more online training, and uh, especially after the first year when we did a lot of in-person training, uh, maybe that'll be the way to go in the future. But time will tell. Uh, we have to, to hear from the Kansas Department of Ag uh, as to what their requirements are going to be. That is pending. And in the past, when dicamba drift issues arose, individual states had an opportunity to reinforce limitations of use of the product even further. Is that still? Well, that, that certainly air? has been the case. And in fact, probably the most restrictive uh, state last year was Arkansas, where they had had major problems the two previous years. They banned the application of all dicamba products after April 15th. But interestingly enough, they still had a significant problem uh, even after doing that. So again, that was an indication that there were a lot of illegal applications going on. So uh, we'd like to think that the states would have the latitude to uh, provide or add some additional restrictions. Uh, However, there has been some questions uh, raised about whether they can actually do that or not. So again, time will tell on how that all shakes out. So as you would talk with, and you probably will be talking over the winter during the meeting circuit with producers about what's out there in regard to the dicamba-resistant crops and the availability of herbicide applications on those crops, dicamba, of course, what are you telling producers or planning to as far as what they need to think about in utilizing this technology? Well, again, I think they just need to be careful with the use of the technology. And the other question that comes up is, you know, what was the impact of the injury? There was a lot of concern because it was very widespread. It's very visual. And the soybeans, again, are extremely susceptible at very low rates. They've seen visual injury symptoms at rates as low as one twenty thousandth of a typical field use rate. So just because you see injury doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see a yield loss, that doesn't make it right, okay? We still don't want to have to worry about the non-target injury, but there still are a lot of questions about what was the true yield impact of the non-target injury. And, and so, that's getting right at the research you've been conducting here, correct? It, it, really, it really is. And so the Kansas Soybean Commission indicated that they were interested in some further research on the impacts of the dicamba injury on the soybeans. So, so we proposed some research. Uh, uh, it wasn't novel research by any means. In fact, there's been previous research looking at the effects of dicamba on soybeans. Uh, But we proposed a study in which we would apply dicamba at three simulated dicamba drift rates, one one thousandth, one five hundredth, and one one hundredth of a field use rate. And we kind of use that one one hundredth as a threshold uh, dosage because with a lot of herbicides, you don't even see symptomology at rates less than one one hundred. But clearly with this one, you can So we uh, applied those three rates at three different timings, the B3 stage of growth, the R1 stage of growth, and the R3 stage of growth. So the early vegetative stages of growth and then two early uh, and mid-reproduction stages of growth. In previous research, again, it indicated that there was more potential for injury and yield loss once you get into the reproductive phases. So, again, we just wanted to document that and confirm that. The other thing that we did that really hadn't been uh, done much in the past is to look at multiple exposures because we're pretty confident that that occurred. If you have a non-extend soybean field kind of surrounded uh, maybe on all sides even by extend soybeans with uh, dicamba applications at different timings, there's a good chance that they're getting hit more than one time. And so, again, we applied the dicamba at those same three rates at different timings, you know, each one by themselves at those three timings. Uh, We had the combinations of two different timings and then also even three different timings at the, the three respective rates. And as you would expect, we saw an interaction among the, the timings, the rates, uh, and uh, the multiple application uh, exposures. And uh, certainly, as uh, had been experienced in the past, there was less visual injury symptoms uh, with the early exposure at the V3 uh, application timing than when we got into the reproductive phases. And it also persisted much more through the season with the later exposures than at the V3 stage. In fact, by late in the season, uh, we didn't see all that much injury from the applications at the V3 stage. If you didn't have an untreated check next to it, you probably wouldn't even notice it. 
That was not the case with the applications at the R1 and R3. That was noticeable through the entire season. Of course, we saw a rate response as well, mm-hmm. more injury from a higher dosage. Unfortunately, you really can't distinguish dosages uh, out in the field. You have no idea what dosage uh, it was exposed to. And as you would expect, much more of an effect with the multiple exposures than with a single exposure. We harvested those uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Unfortunately, we got delayed with harvest uh, because of all the rain. Now, it had been very dry through much of the growing season, but then we got later. Uh, That probably had some impact on on the growth and the production of those soybeans as well. And again, as uh, was the case in the past, the yield reduction was not as great as you might have expected from the injury symptoms early in the season. To what degree, though? Yeah, and in fact, we ended up getting actually halfway decent yields on our untreated check uh, in the mid-40s. With the V3 applications, uh, we actually saw very little yield loss, uh, regardless of rate, at the application timing. And that's kind of what we said. Okay, if it happens before it goes reproductive, it's probably not going to be all that serious. Uh, as we got into the R1 and R3, uh, we saw more yield loss, and especially at the 1 100th use rate, quite a bit more so than at the 1 500th and 1 1,000th and really didn't see all that much yield loss at those two rates from a single exposure, regardless of timing. And then as we got into the multiple hits, of course, the injury and the yield loss uh, uh, increased uh, fairly dramatically, especially, again, when we had uh, multiple exposures in those reproductive stages. Uh, And we experienced as much as about 70% yield loss from the 1 100th use rate exposed at all three timings. So, again, there was a gradient there depending upon when the exposure occurred, what the rate was, and how many times that it actually got injured. And that would be kind of what you would expect. So that collectively considered, it's clear that dicamba-sensitive soybeans will be affected. But how does this factor then into good stewardship and management of dicamba usage on resistant soybeans nearby? Well, again, primarily we want to follow those label guidelines. They are there for a reason. And the other, I think, very critical factor, again, is when and how we use the dicamba. The early season application pose much less risk of causing a problem in the first place And if we do see a little bit of non-target injury from those early season applications, uh, the long-term impact is going to be much less. That doesn't make it right. You shouldn't have to worry about it, but it is going to be much less. So, again, follow the application guidelines. Communicate uh, with your neighbors. That's a very important part of this stewardship process. And, again, I think we did see that this year. Farmers getting together, making uh, each other aware of what kind of soybeans they were going to plant, where they were going to plant them, and just avoiding those scenarios when you are at greatest risk of, of causing a problem. It sounds like, in closing, Dallas, progress is being made that may allow for this technology to be utilized in a, a practical and safe fashion at some point. And, and we would hope so because it has been beneficial from a weed control standpoint. Yeah. Now, we don't want to rely just on that or we'll have the same problems again with resistance to dicamba. Uh, So good stewardship is extremely important. It can work well from a weed control standpoint, but just make good judgment on when you apply and how you apply it. And producers, be alert to further information on the new registration. It's actually a re-registration of those three dicamba herbicides to be applied over the top to soybeans and cotton, which can tolerate those applications as information rolls out here in the coming weeks. And we appreciate the word on all of this. Dallas, thank you for coming over. My pleasure. Not really a fun topic, but obviously a very important one. That's Dallas Peterson. He's a weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and we'll return with more on this Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. 
This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and welcome back. Now, today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Beginning with the Harvest Progress and Crop Condition Report from the USDA. And uh, for the week ending this past Sunday here in Kansas, our topsoil moisture supplies 19% surplus and 78% adequate, only 3% short to very short, while subsoil moisture supplies 9% surplus and 84% adequate, 7% short to very short. The condition of the Kansas winter wheat crop, 46% good to excellent uh, at that 38% fair and 16% poor to very poor. Winter wheat planting now 83%. 3% complete, 95% is the five-year average for the date. And winter wheat emergence at 69%, that's behind the 81% average for the date. The Kansas corn harvest, now 85% complete, still behind the 90% average. Soybean harvest, 63%, still well behind the 82% average. And the grain sorghum harvest at 49%, even more well behind the 69% average for this date. As for corn and soybean harvest progress nationally now, we turn to the USDA's Stephanie Ho with this report. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey has the latest corn harvest numbers for the week ending November 4th. We did see a modest increase overall from 63% overall harvested a week ago to the current number of 76%. But for the first time this year, the national harvest number has fallen behind the five-year average, which is 77%. He says this year's progress is still ahead of the same time last year. When just 68% of the corn had been harvested by November 4th. He says the best progress was in the previously saturated upper Midwest. We saw a 23-point increase in the harvest percentage in Iowa, for example. He also noted good corn harvest progress in Minnesota. But for the last week, the heavy rains have shifted into the southern and eastern parts of the Corn Belt. So we saw less than 5% of the crop harvested during the last week in states like Illinois and Missouri. The picture for the nation's soybean harvest was similar to the corn harvest. Our best progress was in the western and northern production areas, and we saw field work virtually stalled as you move to the south and the east. The overall soybean harvest inched forward to 83% complete. That's up 11 points from last week. But still, that 83%, well behind the five-year average of 89%, and behind last year's 89%. He points to areas where the most progress was made. We did see harvest progress ranging anywhere from 15 to 21% of the crop just in the last week in several states, including Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. Kansas had the country's top soy harvest figures this week. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. A top USDA official says the ball is in China's court regarding the current trade dispute. It's hard to predict what will transpire at the G20 summit between President Trump and Chinese President Xi. That, according to the Deputy Secretary at the USDA, Steve Sinsky, it depends, says Sinsky, on whether China is willing to come to the table in, as he put it, a meaningful, robust way to address long-standing market access concerns held by the United States. Sinsky went on to say whether it affects poultry or beef, their biotech approval processes, other products, and the intellectual property or not, that's going to really determine how the meeting goes. News of the proposed meeting later this month in Argentina is widely viewed to be at least a hopeful sign of progress toward an easing of trade tensions between the U.S. and China. And the value of U.S. agricultural imports slipped to $9.46 billion in September, according to the USDA, the first time under $10 billion so far in this fiscal year. That put total imports at a record $127 billion. Ag exports, meanwhile, eased to $10.3 billion in September, pushing the total for the fiscal year to $143 billion. That was below the level expected by the USDA of $144.5 billion. The monthly trade surplus was $852 
$2 billion for a total trade surplus in fiscal year 18 of $15.8 billion. Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning the corn silage that we've harvested in 2018 and some feeding recommendations that we might want to consider as we move forward. I know many of you are probably haven't started feeding your 2018 corn silage, but some have, and there's been some mixed results with that. Some have seen milk production go up and some have seen it go down. Probably a lot of different reasons for that. Obviously, the 2017 and the 2018 crop are vastly different. 2018, in many areas, we had drought and a lot more stress, so we may have less grain levels. But a more important part of that is that the fiber digestibility might be vastly different in 2018 than it was in 2017. Why is that? Well, in general, when we have weather stress, i.e. dry weather or drought, the digestibility of the NDF in the plant goes down significantly. You couple this with the fact that we may be dealing with less starch in those silages, and now you have a double-edged sword, which can really reduce the milk production in your herd. Add to that the fact that the starch may not be fully available yet. Generally, it takes about 120 days of fermentation before we really have the adequate breakdown of the starch formed in the kernels so that cows can get maximum benefit from that. Some things we can do to identify whether or not the forage quality, i.e. the silage quality, is really the issue would be some things we can do in the laboratory. On the fiber digestibility side, I'd encourage you to work with your nutritionist and look at several different factors from laboratory results. One of those would be UNDF240 digestibility or undigestibility if you want to look at the reverse side of that. And the undigestibility part is maybe the more important part. That gives us an idea of how much of that fiber is really truly undigestible in that particular forage. Another thing you can do to try to assess the starch availability is to look at seven-hour starch availabilities and digestibilities. Again, that can be done in the laboratory. So some testing of your forages may be in line, particularly if you're not seeing the level of milk production in your herd that you'd like to see as you move to 2018 corn silage. Now, if you're still waiting to start feeding that 2018 corn silage, one thing you can do is you can get some analysis done before you actually start feeding. That may help you avoid some drops in milk production because you can make adjustments to the diet. Again, you need to work with your nutritionist carefully, recognizing that we probably have some challenges with our 2018 corn silage. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. This Agriculture Today concludes on another aspect of wildlife management. Charlie Lee is aboard once more. Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Charlie will venture into the topic of field and turf rodent control today and new research on a possible remedy to certain rodent problems. What we're talking about here primarily would be pocket gophers and voles, you say. Yes, pocket gophers and voles can cause an extensive amount of damage in a variety of situations. It can include loss of crop production when voles damage plant production soon after row crops are planted. They also can significantly damage vegetable plantings. Uh, There is some concern also about food safety, disease transmission, and then with the pocket gophers, you have damage to irrigation and water storage infrastructure. You also have loss of forage being able to be harvested because of the mounds, and then the thinning of some of those alfalfa stands, all caused by pocket gophers. We've tried for a long time to use integrated pest management to solve some of these damage situations. 
That can include habitat modification, cultural practices, exclusion, trapping, uh, burrow fumigation, and the use of rodenticides. Unfortunately, rodents have now developed a resistance to some of those rodenticides. Rodenticide resistance in the United States uh, was first recognized in the, in the late 70s uh, in eastern part of the United States. It's since spread uh, westward. Now we have rodent-resistant populations in urban communities such as Chicago, New Orleans, Kansas City, New York, quite a few different locations where rodents are exhibiting resistance to some of the commonly used anticoagulant rodenticides. So that leads to the, the need for alternatives. If the rodents continue to develop resistance to our commonly used products, uh, they are a significant pest, and we're going to have to come up with additional techniques in order to manage those populations in some situations. Hence the evaluation of a different product. You might outline what it is and what it does. Well, there is another rodenticide that's a non-anticoagulant that has been registered since uh, 1984, and it's colocalciferol. And it's actually vitamin D3, and vitamin D helps the body maintain a calcium balance. And when you feed excess doses of vitamin D3, you can end up with too much calcium in the blood, which affects the central nervous system, the muscles, uh, cardiovascular system, and the kidneys. It's been a product that's been used in some situations, but never really gained a widespread following and doesn't have a very large market share. It's a product that seems to be fairly uh, effective and with minimal problems of secondary hazards. However, it's fairly expensive uh, when it's compared to some of the either first or second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. It does have some promise, though, which prompted this analysis by the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to see if this particular compound, colocalciferol, has a place in rodent control. Yeah, so they're starting to look at combinations of rodenticides in order to overcome rodenticide resistance. And so they're looking at various combinations of colocalciferol with either first or second generation anticoagulants. Now, the concern with second generation anticoagulants is that they pose some secondary toxicity risks. Mm -hmm. Second generation anticoagulants like rhodifacum and bromodialone and difethylone are those that are very widely advertised and marketed currently. However, they also pose perhaps the greatest risk to non-targets in the environment because of their high potency and the long half-lives uh, in various tissues. So some of the first-generation anticoagulants like chlorofacinone, difacinone, as well as strychnine also pose some risks, although those risks are deemed to be lower than the use of second generation anticoagulants. So the, the project was designed to develop a product that included both colocalciferol and first or second generation anticoagulant rodenticide baits. And so the combination was studied and evaluated, and what about the results? It sounds as if they were quite promising. Yeah, they were actually very uh, efficacious in depending on which product they were combined with and the, the rate of those second or first generation anticoagulants. But some of the efficacies were 100%, 100%, 80%. Those are pretty high efficacy ratings. It was not quite that high when it was used on the pocket gopher trials. But keep in mind that pocket gophers feed in a different manner. They're used to feeding on vegetation it's more difficult to get pocket gophers to switch over to a processed pelleted type bait. And I think that's one of the reasons that some folks are frustrated with the use of poison grain baits for pocket gophers is that they don't yield the efficiency and the efficacy that they would expect. 
But with the combination, they got pretty good efficacy, and I think there's certainly some promise there, uh, whether it's used for voles or for pocket gophers. But the use of that combination is something we're going to have to delay until the products are properly registered. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, these are still just demonstration-type products, still early on in the stages of the research, and I'm confident that eventually we will have additional options for managing some of these burrowing rodent problems. By the looks of it, though, this combination could address the resistance issue as well as the worries about those secondary hazards did. Yes, I think it's uh, it's got a lot of positives to offer. Certainly, it will be an additional tool. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how it comes out cost-wise, mm-hmm. but I expect that the combination of rodenticides is going to be a primary tool in the near future. Again, this research has paired up the anticoagulants that have been commonly used in vole and pocket gopher control with cola calciferol as an additional product, and it may well turn out to be a combination of choice. Charlie, thanks for the overview of this. He's a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee. And that is today's edition As always, thanks to you for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.